Thank you. It's so nice to be here. It's also nice to be in New York. I really feel that my career has been here. And I moved to New York. I'll give you a little. I usually don't do this. But I moved here in 78. And my first one-person show was in 86. So it's been a long time. And um, what's exciting for me tonight is to see um, the recent work. I, in 2012, I had a Rome Prize. And so that work hasn't been in New York. So a lot of the early work, which I'll start, um, even though I didn't do the Roadrunner. <laughs> I wish I had. He's my inspiration. So um, I wanted to start by reading somebody who I think is really appropriate right now. Is Right now, it's a tough time. And uh, Italo Calvino is somebody who I've always turned to. And he had a wonderful book called Six Mom uh, Mementos, Mentos, Memos for the Next Millennium. And one is lightness. And so he says, whenever humanity seems condemned to heaviness, I think I should fly like Perseus into a different space. I don't mean escaping into dreams or into the irrational. I mean that I have to change my approach, look at the world from a different perspective, with a different logic, and with fresh methods of cognition and verification. The images of lightness that I seek should not fade away like dreams, dissolved by the realities of present and future. So on that note, um, we'll go. So let me figure out how I, what I press. So I came to New York, and the first work was fabricated, found, and also I started making work. And this was a fabricated wood piece called the Daisy Chain, and it was stolen, an appropriated image from Andy Warhol. So all of these pieces, this is a pocket full of posy, which was at um, Snug Harbor in um, Staten Island. And all of these pieces were malleable forms. They weren't yet my hand. I like this iconic images. I liked images that represented um, a certain narrative, but were very open. I was looking for a very open narrative. Um, this is called Wallflowers. So I think in my early work that I was really sampling. And um, I think that's what you do, that younger artists do, and, and trying to find your voice. Um, I liked things simple. I liked a ge uh, simple geometry. This, the wallflower, was made out of little paper flowers, probably about 560 pinned to the wall. So this idea that the structure is the wall and um, the beautiful structure and the woman who isn't asked to dance is the, is, becomes the beautiful flower. Also, you can think a rose is a rose. So fabricated to found, to also um, just using kind of everyday materials. I like this idea of a kind of low key between art and life, which Rauschenberg talked about. So I was using um, party puff and um, uh, candles and cardboard, just things that I could get at the at, at Woolworths. And this is a piece called Level World Hilly Sea. And it was the first show I did in Europe. So this is, I like things open, but I also like this idea of containment and was, I was starting to bring color into the work. So you see these kind of wooden pieces that are very geometric forms. They were flowers, but, and, but there was no color. And I was really looking for um, a way into um, process and color and making. And this is a piece also that kind of references Duchamp and is called The Color of My Fate. So at a certain point, I was like, well, I want to start making things. But I want things, I want to kind of find my hand and using simple materials. And so I just kind of uh, learned how to make pom-poms. And this is a piece called um, oh, Carpet of Color. And I like this idea that you know, underneath, everything seems very beautifully made. But underneath, you know, everything's just kind of thrown together and safety pins together. So um, uh, showing the kind of structure. So it's my little carpet of color. So at a certain point, and you can see there were different kind of um, ideas and um, different uh, 
ways of approaching ideas and, and form. And I got very interested in trying to, in the study of simplifying things. And um, I also was interested in how do I, I didn't study sculpture, I really studied painting and printmaking, and I wanted to know how do I bring those kind of issues back in, and also with the familiar, but also things that um, were a little bit um, of a different narrative, um, much more abstract. This is a piece called um, the, this, um, the Dwarves Without Snow White. And I thought that the emotions and color were much more interesting than Snow White. And so I started buying, I got just fabric dyed, never worked with textiles at all. I was really interested in just, you know, kind of um, making up a language of painting for myself that was this not painting, you know, bringing in a kind of hybrid language of sculpture, painting, installation, and sort of teaching myself as I went. So this piece was an important piece, um, and it's just dye and um, cardboard boxes, which were dress boxes, and also it was kind of this, you know, notion, it was minimalism, um, with, with textiles, so my Donald Judd boxes that almost became little paint boxes. So the first show that this work was shown at was in um, 1992, and it was called The Blot on My Bonnet. And um, in each one, there's um, Sleeping Beauty, the, the Peggy Lee and the Dalmatians, the, um, a pink puddle, and I love this idea of kind of organizing, learning things are black and white, or they're very colorful, and kind of thinking about the kind of stereotypical ideas of color. So this is Sleeping Beauty, the very beautiful feminine pink colors, kind of this whole idea of fluidity and form. Honestly, I, I really wanted this idea between painting and sculpture. I didn't want things um, up on a pedestal. I didn't like pedestals. I wanted things that were familiar and I wanted um, to kind of break that, those things down. So um, what was interesting too is learning to make form, form that kept changing and also work that's situational, also installation. So I was teaching myself installation. So these works went out into the world. This was in a painting show and the kind of painting context started coming into the work. I felt that painters were very generous to me because I wasn't taking the wall space, so they, they allowed me into their club. Um, so this piece, um, which, here, let me see if I can go back and forth here. So this piece could become this piece, and this was at the Gramercy. Um, this was the old days of, um, uh, art fairs, and you can see Elisa Yuskavich, and um, what they did, they said, um, we love your work, what would you like to do? And I said, I'd like the bed, uh, I'll take the bed, the bed, and I got the best bedspread in Village Voice. So I'm not very domestic, but I love this idea of bringing the idea of domesticity into my work, and that's bringing the everyday in. So, this was, I call it a dead gallery, but um, in, the, in the 90s, a lot of galleries were closing, like now, and opening and closing, and there were a lot of artist initiative spaces. Um, I really loved, I'm very lucky I, when I came to New York, there's a lot of experimentation, there was a lot of um, people doing things, um, just taking over spaces and, and putting on a show. So this piece is called Ground Cover. So what I was doing, at first um, when, with the dye, I would um, open up the a bottle of dye and just pour it. And that was kind of referencing a certain kind of painting. And then I got very interested in another cliche of painting, the seasons, and also this idea of expressionism in painting. So the mark, um, I was learning how to you know, move the mark. Um, so this is my ground cover, and it was in a dead gallery, and so you could only see by the window, um, and then I took off the door handle and you could peek in. This is called La Ventura, and this was at um, Wesleyan College, and 
What was interesting for me, it's also like my Woodstock um, redo, that um, at this point, it was just putting, <laughs> putting what was on in the studio and kind of taking it and learning to work very improvisationally and also on the fly. And um, I remember I, I set this up and I took everything that was in the studio, all these different systems, and then I tie-dye, I didn't tie-dye, I don't know how to tie-dye. I um, took the um, color and kind of sprayed it on and then I cut circles so that you could almost feel the color what was underneath. So at this point, I'm kind of, um, the studio, the space was becoming my studio. So um, there was ugly carpet under this, so I said, I'll just cover it. This is um, about 95. And so then um, somebody wanted, you know, it's funny, if you go into this, there are other pieces that you'll see that I did that went off, and even the top piece, maybe I have a slide, became another piece. So I was appropriating pieces from other pieces. So the, I said I never tie-dyed, then I found tie-dye. And so I made a piece. Um, using tie-dye. And so this is um, Zabriskie Point. And these are Antonioni titles. So the thing is, is that all the um, titling of the work kind of follows what, I'm, what movies I'm watching or what um, books I'm reading. So the, the kind of notion of, of the titles are kind of follow my thought process. But at this point, I was really in the abstract world. This is Wonder Bread. And this was um, the, well, what I haven't done, and, and this was a show where I sh sort of got very interested in the process. And at this point, I was controlling the stain. Um, people call it my Mondrian and, um, and dots. So it was the, if, you, if you've ever, and I should, you know, if you follow, I think Wonder Bread went out of business, which makes sense. <laughs> There's not a lot of wonder these days. So, but one, well, I always thought loved Wonder Bread was this kind of malleable form that you could kind of mush up and, and play with. So, um, and also this was in Belgium, and I love this idea of something that's kind of so sacred and this kind of cheesy American, you know, but it's also the uh, logo too. So, going back to Warhol and the kind of iconic form, so the dot becomes a logo. So the sheets, uh, there are 11 um, horizontal, 11 um, um, vertical, and the sheets are what I put under. So they're my beautiful rags. So what's on the floor is really what's not supposed to be on the floor, the beautiful velvet, and it's flip-flop, the kind of ugly color, to you see the real color, and then what's on the wall are my sh sheets. So I don't, I, this was like, one of the only times I've ever done that. But I really love the, you know, what's not supposed to be on the wall on the wall, what's not supposed to be on the floor on the floor. I have an irreverent nature, and I think I'm also a contrarian. And I think that's how I've ended up in this space. But, you know, it's be really been um, a way to kind of, if you look at the early work too, this kind of horizontal plane. And it's very much about a different tactility and a different physicality, which, I, which has been really important for me. And that's where the installation comes in, that you, you walk around something. You can, and later on, you get in something. So what's, what's this becomes this. And there's a fluidity of form. There's rules to certain pieces. You know, a pile piece is always a spill piece. Is, but um, a piece like this is, is always, um, has a certain geometry. This is the Red Desert, and it was in a beautiful space, and I was interested in this idea of the form can be fluid, that I'm, I'm working in scale, and it can still have this power or this kind of presence. So not everything has to be big and tall and erect. <laughs> 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 yes. So then, um, this was a piece called Splendor in the Grass, Glory in the Flower. And it was at the Modern, and this is 93, 94, 94. And it was in a show called Women and Minimalism, Sense and Sensibility, Women and Minimalism. 
and it's all these different patches. And I thought at this point that the, the stain was really like my fingerprint. And I'm also, I love this idea of quilting and patching and, and still life even of making a piece. So there is a structure and the structure is the color wheel. And um, so you start, you know, and, and this one, it's, it's funny, it should be yellow, but of course I went red, yellow. And, um, but what was nice is this piece hadn't been shown in um, 15, 20 years, and it was at Worcester, and I did a little um, um, nine, work, of my nine, work from the 90s. And this is E. So I like this idea that, you know, the, the work is up almost like a puzzle. And so um, I started cutting the work. And what was curious, there's only one of these pieces, but I also started dyeing on color. So color on color gives you a different weight. I'm always interested in the kind of different weight, the different tactility, the different kind of emotional weight of, of color. Um, so one day, um, I thought of the early spill pieces and the beautiful, like the box piece, and the first stain pieces, and I really like those forms. So what I did is just started cutting those forms out. So everything is hand cut, hand dyed, and um, nothing's ever glued down. So the work um, has, and this was in um, Soho, and it was the first of these shows, and the piece is called Eclipse. And so you can see, going back to the, um, it following the structure of that, the color has four different um, structures, almost like little islands. And it was the first piece you really could walk through and in. And I really like this idea that you're in a painted space. So I cut out the fat, got rid of the white, and started dying. And then within the colors, sometimes you see the opposite hue, because I think it's, it's really interesting to, you know, there's a lot of yellows I can get, but it's really nice to put its opposite. There's a lot of browns and blacks, but it's really nice to put the opposite. So this piece, um, Eclipse, was an Antonioni movie. It starts with the end of a love affair and ends at the beginning. So this kind of optimism, so a kind of reverse optimism. So at this point, um, so this was a solo show, and then um, there was a show about painting, painting the field, and that um, was in, this was a group show and in Sweden, in I think it was in um, Malmo. So it was interesting for me, they said, oh, we want the work to travel, we want to, um, in a show, and so, you know, there the rules weren't. It's like, what are the rules to this work? What's innate to the to the piece? And so, what was innate was, you know, the kind of the sections of the piece, and also kind of the the forms that pieces make. So these pieces are very labor intensive. But what I love is like the canvas, the floor. Um, changes, and it really changes the work too. And it was really for me that the work is experiential, that I'm, I'm sort of learning and setting it up to learn as I, as I go, and it's, it's really by the kind of opportunities that I've had. So um, at a, this was also in Sweden, and I, I think that um, I have one side of my brain that loves excessive and kind of um, extravaganza and um, I think it's obnoxious too, but, and then I love this kind of structure and very simple structure and this is sort of my sweater set or my Ellsworth Kelly um, on the floor, but I have always loved um, ge simple uh, geometric abstraction and I think in another life I probably was one, but it, it comes out this way. And these are different kinds of fabric, so I'm always experimenting with different kinds of fabric. The first materials that you saw, it was crushed stretch velvet and I was really interested in the fact that you look at it and you can never s really get a sense of it, um, that the color and the texture, this is um, a piece called Blow Up. And we also, um, it had a nickname, I forget my, um, uh, it's a, it was um, uh, my um, alien vomit. <laughs> so, but it's a beautiful alien vomit. So, um, but this one had no rules. I could dye any color and, 
any structure, and then it was all. But if you can see the kind of quality of the light, I was really interested in by using fabric that it's not even made anymore. I would go to, um, that's what's so great about New York, I would go to um, and buy a lot of remnants in the fabric district. So I just was working with fabric that really, um, the, as I always say, gravity's my best friend, that really took dye very well and that kind of um, would lay flat. This is at the San Francisco um, in Art Institute, and it's called The Night. And I love this kind of brutalist um, architecture. It's, it's one of the most beautiful um, spaces in San Francisco. On the outside, you have the bay. and the inside, you have this beautiful uh, brutalist architecture. So what was interesting, here I am going into this work, and it's becoming much more about landscape and the organic. And so um, what I really wanted to do is just do a piece that sort of reference the outside in, the San Francisco Bay and landscape. But when I started out, you know, that's what I think is really wonderful as an artist, to kind of pay attention to let the work lead you. And so this was a very large scale installation. I made everything in my studio, packed it in a bag, in <laughs> a box, and then kind of worked in the space. So everything is, is very improvisational and um, situational. And this was upstairs. So um, what I didn't say is this was with this, and this was with this. So I liked that I could show a very kind of structured um, geometry, and these are my Hello Kitty, Hello, Hello Kitty colors, and also each dot matches the color, like when you dress in your socks. And then I'd have downstairs you had this, and a friend said it's kind of the space between two chairs. I'm, you know, I'm in painting, I'm in sculpture, I'm in the installation and a, a different kind of space. Um, this is a space called ice, a different kind of fabric. Um, this is the old Whitney, the uh, Met Breuer building, and it was made for a gallery in um, New York City. It didn't fit in the gallery. And then the happy, uh, the, um, I, I made the piece first for that gallery show. It's called ice because of the reflective quality of the material. It almost becomes like ice, and you think of this organic mass underneath and this kind of life and growth and all these different things. So it has a system, and the system, at a time, I could get 103 colors of dye, and so I wanted to see each section. There's 103 sections, and each section dyed to primary colors and black. So there's a method to the madness, and then there isn't. And each piece is numbered and labeled, which is amazing. So it, it was made for a gallery space. Then the Whitney acquired it. And when they showed it, I decided the best way to organize it was to Marcel Breuer's floor. So I, I was, you know, it was interesting. So that now is set, even if there isn't a grid, there are 103 sections and each section. But I upset each section because I would add other different, I would die on a lot of different kinds of fabric. So here you can see. So at the same time I was doing this, and um, what, when I started ICE, I was working with different fabrics, and I love this idea that um, I, so this is at, um, it was at the opening show at Chiasma, uh, Stephen Hall for the architect uh, people, and the, fl the floor was black, and what was amazing is I could walk up and I could take an elevator up and look down, so people could walk around this piece and they could also um, go upstairs and look down. So, but everything that didn't go into ice when I was trying to make ice went into reckless. And so it was interesting at this time. So reckless is now um, acquired and it was up last year at the, um, it was in a great show called Extreme Abstraction. And what I love about it is that it's, it does have little subsections that follow ice but then when I realized it just wasn't working, I really wanted ice to be ice, 
it became reckless. And I always say it's like my garbage. Um, every, everything went into this piece. So here you can see the extreme abstraction show. And you can see this beautiful white floor. And now, of course, you can see the beautiful uh, Jackson Pollock, which I said to them, it's fine. I'm really, really happy to show with Jackson, but don't put it up while I'm working, because it's a little bit intimidating. <laughs> so, so they did. And you know, it's, it, it doesn't get better, I, it company, that company. So it was just really a, an amazing show. They took over the whole museum, and, and the Albert Knox has one of the most amazing painting collections um, in the country. So this is a piece called Split. And as I was learning to die, I was very interested in this idea of drawing and uh, line. So I started making all these lines that wrapped around this piece. It almost looks to me like a cartoon character, like it's going to kind of come and get you. And this um, architecture was at the Contemporary Art Museum in um, Houston, and it had this kind of architecture. And then the piece traveled to another, to the Kemper, which was the same architect. So it was kind of incredible that um, this piece started out with this kind of extreme. And this was a piece for a group show. Um, it's not a small piece. There you can see the kind of fingers. I call them the fingers that kind of wrap around and hold the, the monster at bay. OK, so here you can kind of see. Um, I, this is a piece um, that is uh, based on um, yellows and browns and lines, yellow, all the yellow kind of, um, it's, uh, I call this series my punk rock series. And you can sort of see, I, I kind of sketch the work. So I actually make all these pieces each time. They're always, can be, they can be different, I don't care. Um, but it, they do have this kind of, um, a certain kind of logic by the, by the shape of the form. So I think of the forms as paintbrush strokes. Um, this is a recent piece, I, it's called Brown Sugar, and um, it's my aging rock star pieces. And this is up right now if anybody goes to LACMA. So LACMA acquired this piece, what's really nice, 10 years ago they've never shown it. And it's in a show called the, Erup the Eruption of the Rainbow, I think. And what was really nice is they said, well, you can put it in the contemporary, the collection galleries. And I was like, are you sure you want this in the collection galleries? But it was amazing, and I got to touch the Noguchi. And then, if, I'm sure if he was alive, he'd have a problem with this. But it was really wonderful. There's Helen Frankenthaler in the other room. You know, there's Moreau, there's, um, that's an Ellsworth Kelly. And what I love is this conversation. It's really interesting for me as an artist to really have this conversation with all the generations. And I'm, I still think I'm sampling. I'm taking from everybody and kind of reconfiguring it. This is a piece called Bones, and I love this idea of being very generous, but I like this idea. You know, it's just rolls of fabric, and I unrolled the fabric, and, um, and this is very reflective fabric. So I'm really interested in the, the viewer's um, uh, kind of the potential of color, the potential of form, but also how the viewer um, walks through the work is almost like a pinball in the, in the pinball machine. And so the color is very reflective and changes. It goes from light to dark. I call it my cheap magic. Um, so the, the, this was at Bowdoin College, and the curator was, of course, wanted a big splat. And I was like, well, no, I'm not going to do that. And I love these pieces, because I really think that the viewer's imagination is, is a wonderful thing. And I really like that idea of tapping into that. So then the Powerpuff Girls came into my life, and I like that idea of, you know, well, when you see this kind of idea of levitation and color and form, and um, when I started, nobody knew who the Powerpuff Girls were, and I love this idea of the color and stereotype. I had my wallflower, now let's update the wallflower by Bubbles, Blossom, and Buttercup. So this was in New York in 2003 one or 2003 and each one is a spiral and Mojo Jojo is at the um, Perez but the original were the blonde 
the redhead, and the brunette. And each one is numbered and labeled and dyed, and it's a spiral of color. That's Blossom, and Blossom, I'm happy to say, is, um, was acquired by MoMA. And it was a really interesting show called Comic Abstraction. And this is, um, uh, this is um, Buttercup, and what Buttercup, and I also think, um, so Buttercup is, there's 103 colors, and then around those colors you can see are the primary colors. But Buttercup, I dyed on a kind of fluorescent um, fabric, so it's a, it's a really kind of unusual, almost like a butterfly wing reflective um, color. And that's, my, that's not me, that's my friend Cornelia Parker, wonderful artist, and she had a gallery in her home in London. And so this was, was there. So the original, I started with the original three, then I kind of um, made smaller, bigger, and then different characters in the, in the Townsville world. Um, so this is a piece called Today, um, I Love Everybody, and it was at a um, place called Triple Candy in Harlem. And I really, um, this idea of drawing and form is something very interesting, but I like this idea of the going back to the dingbats and the Warhol clovers, but almost um, exclamation point and marks. And so I just started, and I thought, you know, green, I need a lot of green, I need a lot of luck, I need a lot of color. And I call them almost my funky flowers. So I just made a lot of shapes and took them out of a box and made these kind of freeform funky flowers. So the flowers um, started coming back into the work. So you saw the found early, the wallflower, but at a certain point, and this is what does, have, what does love have to do with it at Mass College of Art. They have a Polaroid camera, and I said, they wanted me to do an installation. I said, if you let me use the Polaroid camera, I'll do an installation. So I just started madly drawing these flowers. What I like about flowers, they're ubiquitous. Everybody draws flowers, everybody doodles. It has this kind of notion of, of drawing, but not this hierarchical thing again. It's, you know, and flowers, flowers are on the floor. So I started the f color on the walls, the Polaroids, the flowers on the floor. This piece was also called Cartoon Garden. Here you can see the Polaroids. And the Polaroids were interesting. They were one to one. And I was drawing with the dye, and I liked the kind of stain. And I just like, we put them on a board, shot them, pull out the, um, they're 24 by 24 inches, and shot them. And also, you know, it's, it's, it's love, it's peace, it's, um, you know, this is Cartoon Garden, and this was in New York. Um, so just, I, I do do black and white, and I think, you know, what I love is it's, it's how many different flowers could I draw? And, um, and it's graffiti, you know, it's, it's, it's this very ubiquitous form in our, that's, I think, a really beautiful and form. On fabric. This is on velvet, but very flat, so it has no nap, so you don't see any of the, you just, you see the stain. What I like, too, is um, here you can see that, um, so what, too, if it's turned one way, so this kind of in and out of focus is so, which is really hard to control. So with this fabric, if you can see, like the pink is strong, the pink, this is called um, good and plenty. So the pink is strong because the fabric's turned one way, the pink is light, and, and so what I like is it's, it's how you look too. You know, it's always, um, has a lot to do with the light and where you're standing. And so the piece almost is kind of very reflective and very, it follows you. And here you can see close up. So you can see it's kind of a very clumsy form. I put dye in a bottle and just go like this, like a ketchup bottle, and draw. So this is called um, Pink Crush, and this was a show in a show at the Met on Andy Warhol. And what I love is, and this is this photo has not been doctored. 
What I like is, you know, the, like, the color of the um, Powerpuff Girls. They were flying, they levitated. And also that the color, color really can, can levitate. And it almost really fills the room with color. And um, some people know I'm a printmaker too. And the printmaking has been really important. It's a, it's a very different way and um, it's a collaborative way of working. But what's interesting for me, the, it's horizontal too, and this kind of horizontal thing that I have in my work. So we make them and you can see these are, we cut out the flowers um, and it's, it's like the early woodwork too, but we've um, removed them and that's one of the early. Um, so I've been making prints with Durham Press for about um, 15 or more years and they're mono prints. So because um, for me, in this whole idea again of still life and that I'm in control and then I'm there and then I'm making everything. Um, and I think as an artist, it's really important to me. I love the kind of, you know, to be there. I have to be there. And so um, the prints, I'm not interested in, in, in multiples. I'm really interested in, in, in um, monoprints. So, Quickly, at a certain point, um, moving on, um, I, I, and here's my joke, I deflowered. And so <laughs> I was like, okay, you know, um, the narrative is, was really, I wanted to kind of get away from a, a certain kind of narrative. And I love this, again, the, the idea of kitsch and pop and all of these things. Um, I'm of this world and maybe one foot in one world, one foot in another. So um, I was listening to the radio, and that's where I get most of my information. And it, it said, anything can happen in a horse race. And the, 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 the guy who, the horse that was supposed to win ended up last. And I thought, well, that's just like the world. So I decided to do a show called Anything Can Happen in a Horse Race and about gambling. And I had Atlantic City, Las Vegas, and Reno. And Reno silver, Atlantic City's black, Las Vegas all the colors. And instead of um, using the fabric that I was using, I wanted found fabric. And this is Atlantic City, and this is, you can see, and it's all sequins. And so I started cutting the sequins. It's almost like cutting a show or making a dress in the space. So I took fabric with me and I cut for each room. So this work was absolutely site specific and made for the space. And um, this wonderful cheesy um, sequin space. It's almost anti-art art. I like this idea that it's, it's just kind of going into a zone and making something, kind of emptying out, filling up. And the um, negative spaces are as rich as the positive. So, but what I was so excited is the viewer could really go into the space. Um, after that came um, a Carlo visual, a show, and that's sort of how I work. Uh, and this was also um, inauguration of a new building, which is a really great thing. And um, it's the primary colors, and it's sequin color, and you can see the color just um, flies up um, all over the space. Um, I had a piece, it's not in here, that was called Not in Any Way, Shape, or Form. And I think that's kind of the, should be the kind of title of all this work. This is Mini Hollywood, and what I, the color just, really the, the whole space becomes a light box. Um, this show was closed down. The curators didn't think I did anything and really didn't like it. So I was banned in Montana, which was really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Not a lot of people can say that. So, um, but for me, it kind of referenced big sky country and cheesy things like rainbow and light. Um, landscape, but a really different idea of kind of the West. And so um, 
because of me, they took, off, took up the carpet, and the space never looked better. So, so because I got banned in, um, in Montana, I decided to do a really cheesy show. And the cheesy show was called Off Color. So what's interesting to me that, you know, what is the off color? Off color jokes and, you know, in art, you know, the, the, the female body has a, a long history. So I found these slides in a, a flea market in London and decided to base my installation on these colors. So here you have it. So all of these are cut for the space. I take the fabric, cut it. And the, the sequins, are, it's really beautiful color. It's, it's, I love the, this work. I think it's the hardest work for me to do, and it just exists for the show. And um, I, 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 I set that up that way. It's insane, but it's the only way that worked for me. Um, it's sequins. So what's interesting about sequins, if you think about um, showgirls and um, the Rockettes or even Las Vegas, is that this fabric didn't exist 50 years ago. And you know, it's I've learned a lot about fabric, working with fabric, and and just um, all the technology is really, you know, very um, advanced and. And also, you know, it kind of follows a, a really interesting history, too. In this country, we were manufacturing a lot of incredible synthetic velvets and, and really beautiful fabrics. And now they all, all the mills closed at a certain point. Maybe that was the 80s. So a lot of things that I work with, I never can get again. It's, 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 you know what? It's, if you look there, um, you know what? I, it's, it's hard to... It's really hard to, to photograph, but it's, 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 sequin, it's all sequins. When you cut it, it makes a total mess, too. No, they're sewn. So early sequins were hand-sewn. These are all manufactured. Um, go up. It's a real treat to go to the um, textile area. You'll see incredible things, and it's one of my favorite things to do. Is And this fabric... Um, you know, they're always, it's because of fashion, and I love fashion, the way fashion and uh, there's always new materials, there's always, you know, um, new technologies, and it's something that's really fascinating. People think it's so old fashioned, and, you know, you think of um, sewing, and, um, but it's a really in incredibly complex and advanced um, world. So I do love simple craft. And I think that I'm a really kind of bad crafts person, but I also love um, the, the different layers of it, too. So um, we're moving forward because what happened is, at a certain point, um, this whole idea of breaking your rules and saying you're never going to make, if you see, I've never made objects. I really was more in the um, world of... Um, uh, in between hybrid world. So this is a series I did just quickly of Feelies, and it's based on Paul Feely, the band The Feelies, and Rose Cabot, who's an incredible ceramicist. So, you know, history is very important to me, all of these different things. And so what I did to kind of follow my rules of logic, they're not cooked. So I took Plastini and Sculpey, and what I love is they're just like little paintings, but they sit on, um, on tables. So they were as object-oriented as, as I could get. And I make them on, um, I use a um, kind of a spaghetti um, maker, and then I'll also use, um, um, oh God, um, all different kinds of, of clay that you're not supposed to put together. <laughs> so, um, and this was a show in New York also. So the feelies, and after the feelies came something even more extreme called the color revolts. And this was in a little show um, in Chelsea, a little gallery that was run by an ex-intern of mine. And she wanted to do a show of feelies, and I had these in the studio. And she said... Um, 
I said, I don't want to do the feelies, but I have this new work. And she was like, holy shit, how can you show this? So it's plasticine with glitter dumped on it. So again, this whole idea of fragility and vulnerability and things that are not set in stone. I don't like, I have a, a there's something wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> so here you can see. And these were all done in the studio and tactically we got them to the gallery. Um, that's a long story. <laughs> so in 2012, I was amazing lucky to get the Rome Prize. And a year in Rome really, it just, it kind of rebooted my life. And what I spent the year really looking at art and just, you know, thinking I had a beautiful studio, I made work. But what was incredible is this whole idea of, of history and kind of leaving contemporary culture. and and letting it kind of guide you. This is um, Frangelico from the, um, I think it's San Marco, which is um, a beautiful um, monastery. And each cell, you walk, become angels, then each cell has a painting. And I love the idea, again, of art that can slow you down, that is about contemplation, and that was made with um, an idea of the spiritual. So, an unspiritual person looking for spirituality. So, what came out of the work there and I, um, was a series called um, My Color Stations. I had two titles, Color Sessions, because I love this idea of music and sessions, as sessions music is always changing. And I love this idea of change and form and um, malleability of form. But these are also monochromatic painting. It's very beautiful fabric, just tacked up. Um, and there are also um, um, hanging um, uh, beads. So I, it's a series of 12, um, I think that's how many stations. I love the idea of going to a church and finding the stations of the cross and kind of this, that, that a church is an installation. And so setting up the, an installation. So this was at the Lumber Room in Portland, Oregon. And here you can see the beads. This was at Frist Street Gallery. So this was one, um, the first showing of them. And this was the second showing of them. And I, the first showing of them, I didn't have the beads. I came back, um, I'd been working with ceramics and um, started making beads. So the beads are sort of that space that I really missed. I was, if I'm gonna be on the wall, there's gotta be something, something that separates me. And so I started the beads. Here you can see a bead hanging. And, um, so this was the last um, show I had in New York and it's called The Hand Weavers. Um, and what I did was, um, you can see the beads, but I was very interested in this idea of drawing, bringing drawing back, and where I had simplified everything and just using found fabric, I, again, liked this idea of pattern making, and, and kind of, um, so I, I found this kind of the hand weaver Bible and started making my own weaving patterns. So these are all hand drawn with a little grid um, and they're 50. So it was interesting because I don't think, I think the work that I did in Rome had a lot to do with Rome and the color and the kind of spatially. I'm not sure these did, but um, what was happening is, and we're gonna kind of go back in time and we're almost at the end, is that um, years ago I had been asked to um, do a, this was a show of tablecloths and what I did is um, Xerox my, sh uh, my um, stains and it's almost there you can see kind of, cause I think people never saw the, it's almost my calligraphy, it's you know the, my hieroglyphics. But I was asked to make a rug in Oaxaca, Mexico, and it was pre-computer. So um, what I did was, is I did a drawing of my stains, they wove it. 
While I was in Rome, I was um, asked to be in a show with, um, by Dior. And Dior did a show honoring women. It was 17 women artists, traveled all over the world. You said, they said you could do whatever you wanted. And so I said I wanted to go back to 1997 and to where it was AD Gallery. If people have been in New York, knew AD Gallery. It was a wonderful gallery that worked between art and design with artists. So the first rug was AD, and there was a wonderful show. A lot of artists, Nikki um, Eisenman was in it, and you entered the gallery. Everybody got to do a rug. You got to keep your rug. So I said, I want to go back to that idea, and I was in Rome. So um, they said, we'd like you to use the logo of Dior, but what I did was I, I said, that's great, and then I took um, a print that I had done and had those colors, and so this was the two, I think, the first, first rug, and then this rug were kind of, it was like, oh my god, that's my work. What it, you know, you know, I they were commissions, and they were an opportunity. But when I came back, I had also um, been asked to um, do a show at my alma mater. I went to Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia, so I, you know, these I think were kind of preliminary pieces. One ninety seven, one two thousand something, after Rome, two thousand thirteen. And then um, I was giving a lecture at, in, in Philadelphia, and they said, we really want you to do a show. And I had remembered um, Jean, this Jean Davis. I'm from Philadelphia. Um, and so <laughs> forgive me for going in, in a kind of um, circle. But so this is Jean Davis. I think it's 1972. It's called Franklin um, Footpath. And he was asked to do um, a painting. And at the time, it was the world's largest painting. And I grew up in Philadelphia. I um, was very, you know, love this idea. I love the, the, uh, the Washington School painters. Sam Gillian had also had a big installation painting on the outside of the museum. And I just thought, I'm doing something in Philadelphia um, the show is going to be for the love of Jean Davis. So I had, um, that's my assistant, that's my first dog, and that's me in probably <laughs> 1978. I think the photo was New York. And that's Jean Davis. <laughs> so we wove four carpets and in Oaxaca, the same place we found from the Dior was the same weavers, and it's Oaxaca. They hand dye the colors, they hand weave um, the, the rugs, they're hand dyed, hand woven, and um, what was interesting too, we wove Jean into the carpet. So he's there, we had um, also the, um, uh, wallpaper and we had a little room and um, with the historic we even had a piece of the original um, gravel from this um, time and even the people who had painted the the original piece came and it was really beautiful for me because on one hand you know I've been really influenced this is kind of this hybrid of painting this is you know, it was really experimental. It was, you know, bringing painting off the frame. You know, it was installation. And so it was just a really and um, important for me. So yes, it was um, sort of, yes, there's Rome there. No, there's Rome there. It doesn't even matter. Um, so then I did evergreen blue shoes and hippie wallpaper. And Evergreen Blue Shoes was for um, Vermont. That's a terrible slide. I did four big rugs with footprints on them and hippie naked people dancing. And um, so as you can see, I've shown you pieces that travel from one place to another and how they change. And so, and if the context of the work, how it's changed over the years, how 
people have put me in different contexts, which I love. So I could be in a show about minimalism, I could be in a show about pop. For me, that the work has been in all these different worlds and has been open to all of that is really important. So this was at the Everson Museum, and they have one of the best collections of pottery in the country. So I, and also a woman um, ceramicist, I forget her name, but she's from the turn of the century and a, a really incredible glaze. Her glazes were really important. So I got to use Ming vases and almost make it, you know, on one hand you have this kind of hippy-dippy thing going on. And here I think it was more like a Shaker, um, uh, Quaker uh, uh, meeting house. Yes, thank you. She's amazing. And they let me even touch her work. I could place, um, I could um, place all the work. Ro Robicho? No, Robin. What is it again? Robineau. Robineau. She's a really amazing. It was from the turn of the century and very contemporary glazing. So, um, all, while I was in Europe, I um, was asked to, to propose a project, and this one was called um, Red Shoes, um, uh, purple, purple, not purple haze, oh my god, here, it'll come to me, but these are all carpets, and we, um, what was incredible is so now, um, it's, a, it's again kind of like the early um, Zabriskie Point, those pieces in the brutalist architecture. It was this very funky, weird architecture. And the whole installation's on the floor. And what I said, I forgot to say about the work, is people can walk on it. And so, you know, I was slowly getting people in the work in the negative spaces, you know, there were the positive, negative, but now people can be in the work. And the red shoes are from the red shoes of the Virgins of Raventa, Ravenna, the mosaics, and the purple is, the and purple's an imperial color, and if you look at purple marble, just, um, Empera, what's purple marble called? My mind is whatever. But um, so what I loved is it's a kind of, they would weave, they wove, um, and the way they get these color blends, they get, um, it's called in printmaking a split fountain. They weave, um, to, they twist two colors of wool together and weave those. So we got incredible blends. And so this is the first room you come in. This is um, the second room then you can see the scale of it. And I love this little girl. She was fantastic. And you can see the details in the weaving. It's so beautiful. And um, terrible slide, sorry. And that's downstairs. So here you can see then this piece went to um, a biennial. And so the pieces can go to different shows. This piece will be in Katona, New York, in a, a show at the Katona Art Museum. Um, and so, you know, the work can travel. It was made for certain pieces, for certain spaces, but it can be broken up. So um, this was the show that was at the Everson, and my dear friend, um, what I can say is being an artist in New York, the incredible sense of community has been really important to me, and Last year or in the year before, I did a lot of shows um, with friends. And so, you know, it's an incredible, there is, it was sort of what makes New York, New York, is this sense of community. So this was the Three Graces. I'm in the middle. <laughs> and what I did following my, for the love of Gene Davis, I did for the love of Morris Lewis. So they own a Morris Lewis, and they wanted me to work with the Morris Lewis, and that green room had a Morris Lewis too. So what I did was is had fabricated the Morris Lewis, but you can, um, here you can see. We painted the stripes. I had this huge plinth of, um, it's, I don't have a great picture, but the, this is at the Everson in Syracuse. And so I have 400 color-coordinated ceramics from their collection. 
the green room was next to this, and then each room had a Morris Lewis and used work from the collection. What they really wanted to do is kind of bring the work that they had in the collection out and also let the um, Tony and um, Carrie and I work with the collection. It was a wonderful opportunity and really a beautiful show. And here you can see, um, you can, um, my Morris Lewis, you can walk on it. But somebody said when they were cleaning and looking at the, the back of that Morris Lewis, there were footprints on it. <laughs> So here you can see. And what's really wonderful for me is that, you know, it's bringing the community in and bringing people into your work. And I think it's really important as a visual artist that to, you know, education is really important and the museums are trying their best. So what I love, and I didn't plan it, is the kids were dressed the colors of the painting. So we're coming to the end, and this was um, this September. And what, for me, was important about this show, it's called Face, Ge Face Geometry, um, Big Eyes, is that it was bringing all these different things together that I've been thinking about and working spatially. The pieces in the back were done um, 1988, their um, iconic masks, Faces. There's um, the Mouth of Truth, King Tut, um, Narcissus, and they were done the same time the first floor wood piece was done, and they hadn't been shown since 1988. The rest, we fabricated these crazy big eyes. I wanted this big yellow room, um, thinking about alternative religions and kind of um, an alternative way of thinking and outside the box, in the box. And I did 106 um, ceramics. Um, and here you can see people in there. That was a conversation. And each one of the ceramics has a name. So their faces, too. Their abstract faces that I made. We had the beads, almost the kind of my hippie beads and um, the four eyes. This is at Otis, um, the art school in California, and um, it was September to December. So the, all the work was fabricated and made for this space. And it was sort of bringing everything together. Um, Beatrice Woods, a really wonderful ceramicist, is, um, has a place in Ojai, and there's a lot of um, cults and transcendental thinking in LA. So I wanted it to be my sort of cliche and yellow box. And here you can see the heads. And they were um, 1988. And, um, and then you can see the beads. And there was a beautiful skylight. So the kind of, a, kind of almost a ray of light coming through. And the beads are also kind of, you know, the eye in, in you have the evil eye, you have the, this big eye um, in religious religion. And what was interesting, it was sort of based on um, a floor mosaic called the Tree of Life that I saw in, um, in Italy. And it's this very um, early mosaic. It was done by a monk, untrained artist, and almost very outsider. But what it had in it is it had early from, you know, Noah's Ark to um, Adam and Eve to the occult and to all the um, all different signs. And I love this idea that all of these things could live together in one space. So for me, it was trying to get all of these different worlds. It's almost like a temple to abstraction into this kind of space. So there you can see it. And so this is the last slide. And it's a billboard that I did. And it's up in a town in Luton, UK. Um, 
And I started drawing the animals last summer, and probably some people here have seen them in, in, the, in the barn, the animals in the barn. And they sort of were to make myself feel better. Um, I like this idea again of how to draw. And I was looking at um, these online sites, how to draw this, how to draw that. And I was interested in, I started um, script again, and how to write. and. Um, cursive. So in this, um, I was asked, somebody saw the alphabet and they said they wanted the animals. And I think the animals are really appropriate for now. And um, I'll just say the symbol of the giraffe, which appears in a lot of the work, represents the messenger, one who attempts to sturdy his or her feet in life's rocky terrain. Thank you. <laughs>